Okay, welcome everyone to our next lecture on probabilistic reasoning and machine learning. Today from my home recording studio, where I also have a blackboard for explanations. So the lecture will be recorded as well and we, you can watch it via Zoom live now. So that's, I hope everything works. So you can ask questions via chat or you could also ask just by, by yelling at me using, using your microphone. So in the elements chat, there was a very interesting question about intrinsic dimensions and basically the question was um, or maybe let me let me first just show this slide um, when we um, apply different methods like isomap for example the question is how do we know how many dimensions we should expect so are there methods to identify the number of dimensions for problems like isomap and as I said in principle multi-dimensional scaling can tell you something about the dimensionality when you look at the eigenvalues of the reconstruction, so the size of the eigenvalues basically tell you the number of dimensions. However, there are more general approaches to estimate some intrinsic dimension of a manifold. And I want to show you um, one simple method. And I also have a short implementation, which right away shows that it kind of works, but the intuition is quite nice. So suppose you are having um, a one-dimensional manifold, okay, so you have a couple of data points which are, yeah, they are spread out in 2D now, right, right like this, and, but the intrinsic dimension is kind of one, yeah, so the intrinsic dimension is the local dimension of the manifold, so how could we estimate that from data, okay, and for that one, we take one data point, for example, that one, and then we draw epsilon balls around it and count the number of points in here. Okay, so all these balls, they have a certain radius called epsilon. And now we can plot basically the size of the ball and the number of data points that are in this ball. Okay, and then we would expect that this will kind of grow, right? So the larger the ball, the more points I will have in it. And I can do this for every data point. So I could, in principle, generate lots of these figures, lots of these, these curves. And now these curves, from these curves, I can read off the dimensionality. So how does this work? So suppose the number of, um, oh yeah, you see the whole blackboard anyway, so let me write here. So suppose the number of points inside a ball of size epsilon yeah, is something like alpha times epsilon to the power of d. So that is the interesting thing. So by increasing the size of the epsilon, with what proportionality does um, the number of points grow? And if you think about it in a one-dimensional world, if you increase it li like this, then the number of points will grow linearly, okay? If in case you have like something in the plane and you are having a ball that gets larger and larger, then the number of data points is growing quadratically, okay, because you are going into the area. So the D here um, is the intrinsic dimensionality. And we could plot this F of epsilon with such a diagram. And now we only need to determine the D. And this is very much like you've seen possibly in um, algorithms and data structure lecture, where you also make experiments with different problem sizes and you plot the run times and you want to estimate this exponent, whether it's O to N to the five or O to N to the three, you can measure that. And the trick here is um, that you take the logarithm on both sides. So you take the logarithm of F of epsilon and the logarithm on this side, which will be the logarithm of alpha, plus d times the logarithm of epsilon. And now by dividing this side by that side, I get a reasonable estimate for the d. So I can then say the d is equal to something like, uh, so this is not, not the differential, but the usual one, logarithm of f of epsilon divided by logarithm of epsilon. So by this, you get a reasonable estimate. Now I ignored the alpha here, so this is sketchy. So I, I came up with it in the morning with these formulas. So they are kind of still a bit rough, but I think you get the main idea. So by growing these balls, 
you can kind of get these curves and then by looking at the log log plot you can estimate the parameters. Um, I did a little notebook for that one. I added it to the um, nonlinear dimensionality notebook. So it's this one. I uploaded it already so you can play around with it. So basically here I'm taking the Swiss roll data. Now I'm taking the um, distances, all distances, pairwise distances, and I sort all the rows. Okay. And then what I need to do, I need to plot all these rows, but I need to do it in a clever way. And um, so basically on this axis is now the epsilon, the x axis is the epsilon, and the y axis is the number of data points. And so each line here corresponds to a single data point. And ideally we would see is that this goes like a squared function. It's not so nicely to look at here, so it's better to look at a log log plot. And if you do the following, let's first average all the different colors. Yeah, so for every column basically we average all the values so we get a single line and then we taking making a log log plot yeah then we see that this will be a straight line and now from this straight line i can go from minus 1 to 0 for example and i see it increases by 2 yeah so the basically the slope of this line is 2 so d is equal to 2 we can also calculate it or have a little function so it's an implementation that you can uh, play around with and then if you calculate, estimate this um, parameter d like along the way of this curve, you get something around two. So it's not working perfectly. Yeah? Of course, there are problems with the boundary of the manifold and so on and so forth. So um, this little function here is basically doing all the work. It's calculating the distances, sorting them, uh, taking the logarithm, and then I'm also taking the local derivatives. And at the end, I'm also averaging the local derivatives to get a number. And it's like a very rough implementation of this idea, but um, only what I remembered from it. So maybe there are other resources. Here's another example. Suppose I'm having a uniformly sampled box. Okay, so this is data from the zero to one to the power of three box and 10,000 data points. If I do the same plot, you also see that now here I would hope that the slope is three Okay, so that would make sense, so that the box grows with three. However, at the boundary, sometimes weird things happening. And so it doesn't look so nice as what I wanted to have. At the third example, I take a uniformly sampled surface of a sphere. So the data set looks like this. It's a sphere, right? And it's only the surface of the sphere. How do you generate it? You randomly sample from a Gaussian distribution. Okay, so you want to have something isotropic. Isotropic means in all directions the same, so I cannot use this box idea, rent, rent I shouldn't use because then I have like at the corners, I have more data points, but if I have a, a Gaussian distribution, it's like isotropic. And uh, I just normalize it by calculating for each data point the norm and then divide by the, the norm. And this now gives me a data set where the points are on the surface of a sphere, okay? These kind of skills to generate data where you have some intuition, they are very important. And it's good to practice them a bit so that you are able to say, okay, here are three Gaussians in a hundred dimensions and they, the means are off by five or something. So it's good to practice these kind of things or to generate data on the surface of a sphere, right? Could you imagine how to get a surface on an ellipsoid? Yeah, basically you just multiply this now with some covariance matrix or some matrix square root of a covariance matrix, then you would have an ellipsoid. Yeah, so you can generate all these things and um, it's sometimes useful. So this is a nice data set because here up to a certain degree when you grow it, it's, it should really naturally increase like with the power of two. So let's look at our um, intrinsic dim plot. And again, here we can't see much, but then I'm looking at the local derivatives and those are the local derivatives. And here you see very nicely it's like between two, right? And um, I don't know, if you want to play around with it, just download from the Cybo, from the public folder, the latest version of uh, the notebook number 13. And for example, try to make a hypersphere, right? Which basically consists where you project everything on the surface of a hypersphere, but now the surface, let's say it's three dimensional. So it's a solid, okay? And then look whether you get a nice plot where everything converges around three. So if you can get that to work, then you really understood the method, I think. Okay, so maybe it's, so that might be just an additional exercise for the people who really want to know it, okay? 
anyway, it was an interesting question to ask. So how to determine now the dimensionality of something like this? By looking at it, it's obvious, but it might be 10 dimensions in, in 20,000 dimensions. So it's very hard to assess it in, in higher degree. However, also as I show in this demo here, it kind of works, but it's not always perfect, right? So there are some, some glitches here as well and some, some uh, heuristics how to do these things. Okay, so any questions about intrinsic dimensionality? Okay, and this is for unsupervised learning, as I said. So in unsupervised learning, we have the problem. We can only evaluate our model if it spits out a probability or something that we can use to compare different hyperparameters. Otherwise, it's, it's quite heuristic to evaluate your, uh, like unsupervised methods. So in a clustering method, for example, you can define something like intra-cluster distances or extra-cluster distances. So there are some measures for that one. Maybe you've heard of that in other lectures already, how to, or there's the silhouette coefficient. So there are some heuristic measures to do that. And um, those are fine, right? So if, if you do clustering, please use them and get different views of your data. But um, there's, there's no final answer. For me, the final answer is to define a probabilistic model and then to compare probabilities. And in a way, if the silhouette coefficient, for example, works well, I guess there must be a probabilistic model behind. Otherwise, it shouldn't work so well, okay? However, this is only a belief. In supervised learning, of course, we can always check by cross-validation, for example, even if we don't have a probabilistic model. We can check how it is on unseen data. But this is not possible in unsupervised learning. So far, so good. So that was a little excursion back to nonlinear dimensionality reduction, okay? So let's continue with the neural networks. And I think, oh, I forgot the slide where I need to jump to. So we were at this, what is backpropagation? So we've seen already that we can take a neural network and we can calculate the derivative of some loss function and then we just do gradient descent. And now the key question of last time was, what is backpropagation? And as I said, the super short t-shirt answer is backward mode automatic differentiation. So that is the a very distinct uh, short description. So if you know what backward mode automatic differentiation is, you know what backpropagation is. If you don't know what this is, then, but you know what backpropagation is, then backpropagation is an instance of backward mode automatic differentiation. And as I pointed out in the last lecture, the key why this backward mode is working so well is because our loss function is a scalar. And then computing, collecting all the Jacobian ma matrices backward through the computation is a very clever way to do the matrix matrix multiplication, the most efficient way. If you would use the forward mode, you would have to multiply very large Jacobian matrices, which is too expensive, okay? The alternative answer, of course, was to a simple way to calculate derivatives. We looked already at a couple of examples. So we had this little cartoon here, which I don't repeat now. We also looked at some nice slides from Stanford, which were guiding us through some computation. And the key again is maybe this slide. The key idea here is that um, we have some operation F that takes some inputs X and Y and it spits out a, a Z. And now the key is that this function F is, um, can be now dealt with locally. So we can locally compute the derivatives of the output given one of the inputs. And those local gradients, they can be just computed without the surroundings. All I need for this is basically the inputs, so the, basically the location where I'm interested in my local gradient. However, in order to calculate then the gradient of the loss function with respect to the inputs, I need the upstream gradient, which gets generated from the upstream path. So I'm having a forward direction going through the network, and then I'm at the loss. And at the loss, I'm generating basically the backward pass. And as soon as this stream of gradient hits my computation for F, I can combine the gradient that comes in with the local gradients and then basically deliver them to all the previous nodes, my gradients of the loss. And this is the whole idea for backpropagation, that I can have some local operations so the F must know how to compute a forward operation, so how to do the evaluation of the function, and the backward operation where I'm calculating the derivatives. 
Um, for vectorized operations, as I said, so here's another vectorized operations. Last time we looked at the tangent superbolicus at length on the board. And I also showed that for any component wise function, basically the Jacobian is a diagonal matrix, which is super nice because a, a diagonal super large matrix um, can be stored in memory just by storing the diagonal, which is then again feasible and takes computational amount only as much as the forward pass. Also, a multiplication with the diagonal matrix is really simple because it's just a component wise operation of the diagonal elements and the incoming vector. So they have a slide on that one as well. So let's have a, qu a quick look on this one. So here they have an example of a 4,000 dimensional input vector, then a component wise ReLU, right? So this is just operating, uh, calculating the maximum of zero and X and outputting another 4,000 dimensional vector. What is the size of the Jacobian matrix? Anyone knows? So what will be the size of this Jacobian matrix for this operation in here? So you can also write it into the chat. Okay, I have the chat here on my second screen. Does anyone know how large the Jacobian matrix is? So it will be the derivative of this function f, which has 4,000 outputs and 4,000 inputs. Anyone? You can also speak up if you want to. Yes, so there's an answer. Great, there are several answers and they are all correct. So it's a large matrix. So it doesn't sound so large, right? So those are like a million, 16 million elements. 60 million elements, that's okay. However, 4,000 is a very short input vector. In principle, it could be a megapixel input. Yeah, so it's supposed you have a megapixel image. Then you could um, have 1 million inputs and 1 million outputs. And that would be like uh, a billion, uh, what is it? Like a million squared many entries for the Jacobian, which is then ex really exploding. So the answer is correct, perfect. Um, in practice, yeah, here the example is, we are not having only a single vector, but possibly we have a whole mini batch. So we have 1000 vectors, okay? So in that case, basically we have 100 times 4000 and then technically it would be a 409,000 times 409,000 dimensional matrix. So it's really exploding if we don't use a trick or if we don't have an additional insight here. Um, however, the good thing is um, it's a diagonal matrix. And I think here there's now not the answer to this question, but the, the key here is that we found out that to compute the derivative of the first element, we only need to look at the first element. And so they are all decoupled. And so for all these zeros on the off diagonals, yeah, basically the Jacobian matrix can be expressed with as many elements as there are input elements. And that's very nice and very efficient. Okay, so far so good. That is the, the deeper reason why the nonlinearities in a neural network are component wise. However, as I already said, in the transformer model or in some other more complicated neural networks, people also start to multiply things with each other. However, typically then they are very careful in how the backward operation gets computed in an efficient way. And that's always the goal. You want to have the backward operation as fast as the forward operation. So that's super important. Let's look at a vectorized example for such a graphical representation of a computation. So what is the example? In this case now, we are calculating the norm of a transform vector X. Okay, so the W is a matrix. This is now not really a neural network, but it's just any function, yeah? In my lingo, I would also view this as a differentiable computation. So it is kind of a neural network that I can, but it has not much to do with neurons in this case. So here I'm having a matrix vector multiplication and I'm taking these squared norms. And they like this notation, so they take all the entries of this resulting vector, square it and sum everything up. I would write it, of course, in my notation that I like a lot. So for me, it's the same um, W X squared. That's the same as X transpose W transpose W X. Okay, so that's a different notation, avoiding the sub indices. Um, okay, notice here that the input is a vector and the parameter in this case is a matrix and we want to calculate the derivative. So that's the challenge now. So far, if we flip back, 
We looked at scalar examples, okay? So this was a scalar example. That was much easier. Here, every entry was basically a number, a single number that we could calculate. So let's look at the vectorized version. So here's the network. And now um, I, I wrote just a capital W. I, I didn't wrote, but the authors of these slides wrote. So if I do a forward computation now, I need to plug in the whole matrix here, okay? So the W here is now matrix valued. Similarly here, the X is now vector valued. This times here is really a matrix vector multiplication, okay? So we need to be careful, yeah? However, just as a quick preview, we will write down the gradients below. And remember, the gradients will always have the same shape as the number, as the thing, the object that I take the gradient with. So in this case, I'm taking the gradient with respect to W. So the gradient of the loss with respect to W will be also such a matrix, okay? So here everything is spelled out. First of all, they, gave, they give the result of the multiplication, they give it a name and they give it the name Q. So Q is W times X and it can be also written out with all the entries here. So they like to do it here by hand. Then comes the L2 norm. So the output of the L2 is the F of Q, which is just squaring all the Qs. Also here you see the power of naming things, right? So those are Little definitions of new variables, or in logic we would call it definitorische Erweiterung. So we extend our language and putting new letters here, Q and F, yeah, and that makes notation nice. And it does not only make notation nice when you compute or when you write a computer program where you say, don't repeat yourself. I hope you know this rule in programming, don't repeat yourself. So it's also useful when you write down math, okay, to have these intermediate things. When you have the impression that when you do a mass derivation and your ex expressions are exploding, introduce some names for the sub-expressions and everything is nicer and simpler. That's what they did here. So far so good. So this is just matrix vector multiplication. Let's check one. So this is 0 0.1 times 0 0.2, which is, I think, um, 0 0.02, okay? And then we have 0 0.5 times 0 0.4, which is the half of 0 0.2. So this is 0 0.2. 0 0.2 plus 0 0.02 is exactly 0 0.22. Fine. Let's trust the other one. Okay, so that will be 0 0.26. That is the result of matrix times vector. And then this is finally the result of the length of the vector, which kind of makes sense, right? If you imagine a little square with side lengths two and the other side lengths two, right? Then the diagonal, will be something like, oh, is it, does it make sense what I'm saying? Uh, uh, no, no, not really. So it's not really make, so it's not easy to calculate. So easy to calculate. We need to square it 0 0.22. We need to square it. So that will be a number like, uh, oh, I'm bad at computing this in my head. Um, 0 point, oh, let's use the calculator. Okay, so let's check that. So it will be 0 point, 2.2 times 0.22. Ah, okay, fine. So it's 0.04. Okay, that's what I was looking for. And if I do this with 26, I get a 0.06. And if I sum up those numbers and the other things, then I have a 0.11. Okay, so that is really these numbers here. So far, so good. Now, as we do it mechanically now, the backpropagation starts now. We start always. At the end, we have a scalar, the loss. And we are interested in the derivative respect of the loss. So we write down the derivative of the loss with respect to the loss, okay, which is exactly equal to one. That is always the starting point. So that is the first upstream gradient that now gets fed into this computation L2, which computes its own local gradients and which needs to multiply the 1.0 with its local gradients. And then it will spit out something of a certain shape. It will be a vector. It will be a two by one vector. So let's look at this. Let's see what we need to compute. We need to compute the gradient of F with respect to QI. They like to do it now by every entry. So this derivative can be read off from the definition down here. So it's just two times QI. So far so simple. In particular, now we can vectorize it again and say that the gradient of f with respect to vector q is in 2 times q. 
So how do you get this gray formula? You get it by, again, vectorizing this notation, right? By writing down f with respect to um, q1, f with respect to q2, and so on and so forth. And luckily, it has this nice shape, yeah? If it wouldn't have this shape, if it would be more complicated, you can't write it always simply like that, okay? So, 2 times q. So let's guess now, what is the gradient down here? Any guesses? So you can put it into the chat, okay? So what will it be? Can you, can you calculate it in your head? Anyone knows? If you don't know it, please put a no into the chat. Yeah, if, if I see enough no's, then I will explain it, okay? Ah, okay, there's already an answer. Great. Thanks a lot. The answer is exactly right. So the people on TV now at home who look um, like in the, in the future, they can't see the answer. I see it already, so I explain it for you. Uh, of course, if you want to find out yourself, please press pause now, but I think you are clever enough to figure that out yourself. So the answer is the double of this vector here. Okay, so why is that the answer? The reason is this guy over here got a name. It's Q, right? And our derivation showed that the gradient of f is 2 times q. Great. So we just need to identify where in our graph is the q. It's that one. And then we need to multiply by 2. That is basically now the gradient of our function f. However, it's 2 times q times the upstream gradient. In this case, the upstream gradient is 1. So that's why it's just double of the q in this case. Okay, great. So now the next one. That's a bit more challenging now because of all these vectorized stuff. Um, however, there was some intuition, right? This star operator basically is kind of routing. So the derivative of w times x is something like w or w transpose, or it has something to do with w if I take the derivative with respect to x. If I take the derivative with respect to w, it must be something times x or x transpose or something, or maybe some summation, but something simple in terms of x, okay? So let's work it out. So now we are looking at the local gradient of this operation. So we are interested in delta q by delta w. And we do it entry-wise, yeah? And entry-wise here now is another option. So we have k entries in here, or I have several entries in here, and I take the kth entry and I have several entries in my w, so they are called wij. So this thing is in principle a three-dimensional tensor, this derivative, right? Because this is a vector and this is a matrix. So the local derivative here of the input with respect to the output is a three-dimensional tensor. Or if we use the matrix differential calculus notation, it would be in this case a two by two, which is equal to four, it would be a four by two matrix or the other way around, okay? If I collapse all the inputs into the number of rows or columns. So let's look at this. So the QK is basically um, one of the rows in this vector, right? So it's a case row in here. So the case row in here will have a K, right? As the first entry of the W, right? So if I'm looking for the WIJ, I need to find the W where the i is equal to k, right? And um, next, there's a j as well. So the j is picking one of the axes. So for example, if I'm interested in the w1n derivative, yeah, I need to check in this expression for the q, where does the w1n appear? It appears only in q1, okay? So it must be k must be equal to 1, okay? And the w1n is only standing in front of the xn. So the derivative will be just the xn, which is the second entry of the w, okay? So this is a clever way of writing it nicely. So just having, um, in this case, an indicator function, this is the Iverson bracket in our notation of k being equal to i, yeah? So if k is not equal to i, where k is on the, on the top left and the i is on the bottom left here, so for this three-dimensional tensor, there are many entries just zero. All the entries where k is not equal to i, okay? And then for the entries where k is equal to i, which is something like a diagonal style thing in a 3D tensor, 
but it's more like a plane inside this 3D tensor, okay? Um, for those, basically, we can read off the derivatives by looking at the x, the x, j's, okay? So that is an expression for this derivative. Nice. Um, now let's combine this. We need to combine it with basically this derivative. And since, okay, this is a bit cumbersome expression to continue, we need now to use the, the chain rule, right? We have um, the upstream gradient is basically the delta f by delta, um, by delta q sub k, but we have several inputs here. So basically, um, the, this, this node here is sending to one other node, but in practice, actually, this node is sending to Q1, it's sending to Q2, it's sending to Q3, to Q4, and so on. And so for that reason, it needs to collect all these gradients. And collecting means that I need to sum up all these gradients. So that's where the summation sign is coming from. So let me jump back to another slide that we've seen very briefly. So there was this picture. If I have a node which basically distributes numbers, yeah, then it has to collect all the gradients by summing them up. Okay, that's what we just did. Now you could ask, so, but um, there was only one error, but for this kind of discussion for the plus sign here, we need to look at the scalar case. And for the scalar case, basically, um, this operation from the times is distributing it to Q1, Q2, Q3, and so on and so forth. The thing is, so this times is generating a vector. And if I would make a diagram with scalars, basically it would be more complicated. It would um, distribute it to different positions here. Actually, let's do that for one thing. Let's draw this diagram as a scalar diagram just for the heck of it, because it's interesting. Yeah. So let's um, erase the board. So the usual diagram that we've just seen is Wx and they go to some times and then we had some, I think just some L2, right? This was just an L2. And then we have the, the loss. So let's draw another one. So let's have um, W11, W12. Let's write it out. It looks a bit boring, but I think it's instructional because the structure that you get is quite interesting. Okay, so what are we doing? We are combining the first row of W gets multiplied with X1 and X2. The first row are those two entries. So I'm having here some intermediate nodes, which this guy is combined with Z1. This node is combined with the other one. Okay, so this is W11, X1. This is W12, X1. Okay, so far so good. And they get summed up with the plus sign. Okay. And that is basically the result here. So this will be Q1. Okay, so let's, I, I just put a name up here. So this is Q1. Similarly, for the bottom parts, I will also combine the W21 with the X1 and the W22 with the X2. So this is W21, X1, W22, X2. They get again combined with the plus. And the output is Q2. And OK, I could continue now. OK, I could have a squaring function. So square. So let's do that once. So this will be Q1 squared and everything is scalar here q2 squared and then basically they go into a plus node and i'm having the l2 norm of that one okay so far so good however what you see here is um, that it gets quite complicated here right so there's a lot of things going on however i think in this case it's still not the case that one is receiving two inputs. So every input is only used once. Okay, so that is, it's still a simple, simple example. Um, nonetheless, if you write it with these vectors now, 
it happens here that I need to collect the gradient from Q1 and the gradient from Q2. And so for that reason, I need to sum up all of these, okay? And here I'm combining one with the, the appropriate entry and the other one. And again, now I can plug in what I already evaluated. I evaluated this gradient to be two times Q sub K and I have a tensor for the last one, okay? Which has like all these three numbers in here. Um, next again, I need to be a little bit clever here. If I sum up over something like that, where I have Ivers in brackets, K equals I, I'm basically just selecting one of the terms, only the term for K equals I. And I need to replace all the bound variables K by the value of I. So that's why the result of this summation here is two times QI times XJ. So this, the answer down here is already the combination of the chain rule, chaining several grade, several upstream gradients by summation together, okay? So if we now compute this, so now I can basically say this is the outer product of two vectors. Um, this is just the outer product of the x with that vector over here, right? So it will be the top left entry should be 0.2, times 0.22, so is that right? So let's see whether this is right. Oh, this is the wrong one. So it's 0.22 times, uh, what was the other number? Damn, where is it? 0.2, so I need to, to, to learn how to use the calculator here, times 0.2, is it right? No, this is not right. Okay, so here I'm still doing something wrong. Oh, I'm, I, I need to take the gradient one, right? Uh, no, I need to take that one. Huh. So where am I doing my mistake here? Oh, I need to say two times 0 0.2. So let's do it on the board, so that's better. So let me copy it. It's two times 0 0.22 times 0 0.2. Okay, so let's check whether this is Right, so this is 0 0.44 times 0 0.2, and this is 0 0.88 times 0 0.1, and that is equal to 0 0.088. Okay, luckily. Okay, so that is the top left entry. So it is indeed the outer product of these two vectors. You see, the reason why I'm doing these kind of calculations on the board, um, okay, now, you can't see the slides, right? No, you can't see it again. Um, so the reason why I'm doing these calculations, I just want to show you that's how you should go through these kind of slides. You shouldn't just say, ah, yeah, 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 and then this, yeah, it gets combined. Everything is fine. So that's not working. I see it all the time. When I demonstrate something like that on the board, I mess up, right? And that's happening to you as well. And if I mess up, that's very good because then I found out there's a little detail that I not quite understood yet, okay? So for that reason, when you have slides like this, please do the calculations yourself, whether you really got it. Okay, anyway, so this is the outer product of those two vectors. Great. Let's look at the next one. Um, ah, okay, there's a formula for that one. Fine. Okay, so this is the gradient of f with respect to w can be written as an outer product. Okay, that's what I just said. Perfect. Now comes also in the Stanford slides, the, the check, please always check that the shape of the gradient has the same shape as the W. In particular now, in this situation, maybe the choice of numbers was made to be like the minimized, a minimal size vectorized example. However, of course, a better size would be like a, a, a three by two matrix, for example. So that might be a good thing because then you can make the error miss with the shape, right? Here we wouldn't know whether we really have the right shape, but if that would be like a, um, I think a three by two matrix can be multiplied by a two by one vector, then we would have three numbers over here, and then you can mess up with these kind of formulas. So far so good. So the last step is now the derivative of these guys with respect to x, and there it just turns out, okay, my x1, yeah, uh, where does it appear? It appears in, for all the, in the first column. So basically I can vary the first variable with the k. So the derivative of the k's output with the i's input is just the wki. 
And that's just because this is such a simple function, right? So with other words, now combining again, having a summation because we have multiple gradients here coming in, I'm having the, the, local, um, the local derivative, which is q by x, and I'm having the upstream derivatives, which is f by q, and those get multiplied and summed up, okay? And again, now, if I plug everything in, the expressions that I had before, the scalar ones and the other ones, and I sum it up, then this is just a matrix vector multiplication, right? So here, basically, you see, it looks a bit weird, but it's the vector q, which is a column vector. If you make it a row vector and multiply it from the left-hand side to the w, it should be fine. Or alternatively, you can transpose the w, you could say w transpose times the q, and you would have the same computations. So that's a better notation, because this now is giving you the right shape of x, okay? And again, now here we should calculate, and do the check, and do it by hand, right? And let's do that maybe by hand. Shall we do it on the board? Uh, where's my calculator? So don't, oh, here's my here's the calculator. Great. So I have that one. I think in this case now I can use the simple one. So let's see whether we can really do the right computation. And here's the source of error. Now, do I have to multiply the column of W with this column, or do you have to multiply the, the row with this vector over here? So any guesses? Should I do a column times column, or should, should I do a row times column? Any suggestions? Again, those are the two options that you can mess up. And if you don't think, 50% of the students will make these mistakes, I'm sure. So what is it? Row times column in this case, or column times column? So this is what we want to compute, w transpose times q, right? This is just a matrix vector multiplication. So will it be column times column or row times column? If you don't know it, please put a no into the chat. Yeah? Then otherwise, I'm assuming you are still thinking. So are you still thinking? So there's an answer, column, column. Column, column is right because row times column would be the one without the transpose sign. But with the transpose sign, Rows and columns change their roles, okay? So let's try that. So I hope I can use the keyboard now here for that one. So I say 0 0.088 times 0 0.22. So this is 0 0.19, okay? So let's remember 0 0.19, but let's see whether we can, whether this is able to do Punkt vor Strichrechnung. <coughs> then we have 0 0.14 times 0, 0.26, and let's hope for the best. And this is wrong. Okay, so it looks like this calculator cannot do point before the other one. Oh, we did a mistake, so let's try it again. So this is 0 0.2. So let me write it down, 0 0.019, is that what it says? Yes, 36, fine. And let's take the other one, 0 0.104. The thing is, if this now doesn't work out, yeah, and it's wrong, then we need to dig deeper, okay? So let's see what's that one. 0 0.027, and then there's a 0 0.4. Okay, fine, let me say just, I'm adding now 0 0.01936, and the result is the same as before. So what is going on here? Why are we wrong? Oh, yes, maybe we are missing something. There's also a times two over here. So let's say times two. Whoops, no, that was the wrong one. Times two, can I do it? Yes. Do we recognize it now? No, we can't. So there's something wrong, right? So there's something that we didn't understand yet. Any ideas what we are doing wrong? I think, yes, there is the, the factor two in the beginning as well, that's right. And there's a nice suggestion of using Python, so maybe I should use Python. You're totally right, so I should use Python. So here's my, my. Um, let me just um, stop this background, okay. So I hope you can see it. Let's make it large and nice, so that I can also see the numbers. Python, perfect. 
So I show you the, the mistake that we are doing. I multiplied somehow the derivative, right? But I need to multiply the W. Okay, I took the first column of the derivative here, but you need to take the first column. Okay, so there's another option how you could be wrong. You could be wrong with the rows and columns, and you could be wrong with taking the W or the gradient of it. Okay, so let's take now the right one. So it's 0 0.1 times 0 0.2 plus minus, okay, it's a minus 0 0.3 times 0 0.26. And now let's hope for the best. The number that we want to see is now minus 0 0.112, okay? And it's not. Okay, there's still something wrong. So what are we doing wrong? Anyone knows? I'm confused. I think the numbers have been double checked very often already, but we are messing up here. Hmm. Oh, now we are missing the two. Okay, two times. And now we are there. Great. Okay, so minus this one. So to double check that we really did a good job, so let's type in the other one. 0 0.5 times 0 0.22 um, plus 0 0.2 times 0 0.26. And hopefully this will be 0 0.636. And it is. Okay, great. So now we figured it out. Um, why am I going through these details? Because there are so many possibilities to mess up with these calculations. And I'm sure this will be an exercise and I'm sure this will be an exam question, right? So it might be, I'm not sure yet whether we use a vectorized one or not. I know the vectorized one is more fun and it's more difficult, right? So you could, more, you could get more points. So you should be happy if you get the vectorized one. The scalar one gets fewer points. However, it's, it really can be done. And if you can do it, then you really understood the details of backpropagation. Okay, so that's why this example is so important. Great, so far so good. Any questions about this? So let me just stress, the thing is, do the forward computation in green, write the one down here, and then you do the backward one. And the backward one is a bit tricky for the vectorized version. Good. Back to our slides. And great thanks to Justin Johnson, Serena Young, and Fai Fai Li. And they wrote, I wrote them an email and they told me, yes, you can use it for your lectures. Okay, so let's continue. Um, we could think about the whole thing, neural networks more general. And I like to think about it more general, right? Um, oh, there's a question. Could you shortly explain what a tensor is? Yes, of course. So just a second. So before we continue with this, let me just briefly explain what a tensor is. So I think it's somewhere on the slides, but that's fine. So what is that one? That is a scalar, OK? 70.5, for example. That is a scalar. Here's something else, uh, let's say. 2.1, 3.7, so that is the vector. And then I could have something like this, 1.0, 1.0, minus 0 0.4. So that is the matrix. And now you could say, OK, a matrix is one of these things where there's a negative entry. But of course, that's not the point, right? These are elements from R to the 1. Those are elements from R to the two times one, right? Because I'm having two entries here and one entry over there. You might want to write it like this. Okay, but you can also write it like one times one, two times one. And this is two times two. Um, okay, so maybe let's have it more consistent. Let's say this is R to Z. Uh, or let's just write R, that's fine. And this is R to Z two. And now what would be the next one? The next one would be 2 times 2 times 2. And it would be like a cubic thing, right? So it looked like a cube. And I would have like eight numbers in here. And now we need a new name, OK? So what would be a good name? So scalar is gone, vector is gone, matrix is gone. So we need something new. And so this is a tensor. That's it. And it's a tensor for all the other generalizations. Actually, also, 
in principle, those are all tensors, kind of. Yeah, maybe even the first one could be seen like a tensor, right? So this could be like called a one tensor, a two tensor, a three tensor, and this could be a zero tensor, okay? So a tensor is just a generalization of a matrix. However, that is like the data structure explanation. In mathematics, often there's more structure if you have a tensor. So there's something like a tensor product, there's something like a quotient space and something com more complicated for these kind of tensor products, but we don't worry about it. When we talk about tensors, we just mean higher dimensional arrays. Okay, so that's it. Okay, if it didn't answer completely your question or you, anyone has another question, go ahead. Now's a good time to ask. If there are no further questions, then let's continue with the slides. So, um, in principle, these neural networks are the ones linear operations, tangent hyperbolicus, linear operations, and so on and so forth. However, I'd like to think of these more like computations or any computer program with parameters. Um, as long as you can calculate the derivatives, I would view it like as an example of a neural network in a way. However, the neuralness of it is kind of disappearing. Um, there's a nice paper by Leon Boutou, who's a colleague of Jan Lequin. So Jan Lequin did a lot of neural network research together with Leon Boutou. So there are two persons. And Boutou wrote a paper together with some other person, Gallinari. Um, and he called it a framework for the cooperation of learning algorithms from 1990, 1991. So it's quite an old paper. It's like 31 years old, amazingly. And there they basically take the point of view that a neural network is basically a very general computation that can be where you can calculate the derivatives of. Okay, so it's all there already. And we can think of different building blocks. So in a nutshell, we could view neural networks as sequences of computational blocks yeah, um, or bricks. So you could think of like little Lego pieces where every Lego, Lego pieces is like a computational object which can calculate its forward computation and it can calculate its backward computation. Okay, so you can do both and you can stick them together as you like. Um, more general, we could also view neural networks as directed acyclic graphs of computational bricks. So not only sequences of them, but they could be arbitrarily structured. And um, we could of course now discuss what kind of blocks. But before that, let me show you the picture of these graphs. So that should go to the beginning. So those are the pictures of the sequence of, block of bricks. And this is like the typical way we think about neural networks. They are like this, but nothing stops you from using any directed acyclic graph in this case, okay? And um, the more you think about this DAG idea, you see that if you write a, a computer program, any computer program can be somehow expressed like that. Even one with four loops. So suppose you have a loop here and you loop around and you stick at B8. In principle, you could unroll it into a directed acyclic graph going through the steps of the program. If we assume that the program terminates, okay? Then you can do that. So any DAG or any computation could be viewed as a neural network as long as each of these bricks can calculate its derivatives automatically, okay? So let's flip back and let's look at examples of these bricks. So here's the first brick, okay? The very general brick, the super general one. So we have some input X, output Y, and a parameter W. However, here's a choice of calling one the input and the other one the parameter is kind of arbitrary, right? It's just the way we think about these things, that we have something that we put in and we do a computation that is parameterized by W. However, there's nothing to stop you from swapping W and X, right? So they could change the roads. They're both inputs, right? So when you look at the structure of the graph, both has an error pointing towards the F. So they're basically just by us called parameter and input. Um, there's the forward implementation for the block f, okay, which is just evaluating the function, whatever it does, maybe a sine or cosine or whatever function you like, or maybe a rendering of some 3D scene in Blender and the output is the movie. So it, it's very general point of view. And now for the back propagation, we need to update two things. Uh, we need to do two things. We want to typically update the parameters. So we are interested in um, 
the derivative of the loss, which is at the very end here of some computation, right, which is actually what we need. So that is the one that we need to update the w. We want to do gradient descent with respect to the loss. However, that can be decomposed using the chain rule with this intermediate output, so just the output behind the f. And then we get typically the gradient of the loss with respect to y. We get upstream uh, from the upstream kind of passed on. And we combine it with the local gradient of the f in this case with respect to the w, where here we write it as partial of y, right? Because that's the output. And this is coming from, oh, so the uh, derivative of e with respect to y is coming from upstream, and the derivative of y with respect to w can be calculated locally. And by multiplying them, we have now the gradient to update the w. Similarly, we can compute the gradient with respect to x. And when you look at the formulas, they are really identical. However, we use them differently. So here we would say the parameter w now, that's like a dead end. Okay, so this is like something that is not computed, but this is a parameter that we want to set. The x might be the result of a computation itself, so we need to generate the gradient to pass on to the inputs of x, and that is exactly what we compute on this side here. Okay, so that's what the distinct was how the input is distinct from the parameters. The parameter is kind of a dead end for the back propagation, and the input that might be the, the result of another computation, there we could pass on the gradients. So here's a particular example, the linear block. Okay, we've seen that one many times already. So it's just matrix vector multiplication, super simple. And we can also spell out these different gradients here. Where again, here we need to be careful with the dimensionality and so on. So this is not the gradients that I wrote down here, but this is a partial derivative and the size of the object it's a bit cumbersome here, so then we need to be a little bit careful, right? It should be fine, I think, what I wrote, but you need to be careful. In particular, so there's a vector coming in, and this must be interpreted like a row vector now to be able to be, to be multipliable with the matrix W, which is multiplied from the right-hand side, okay, which is the correct one. Or you could say W transpose times the gradient of E with respect to Y, and then this one will be not a row vector, but it will be a column vector of the same shape as y. Okay, so this is just a cartoon, what I wrote down here. But the gradient with or the derivative with respect to w is obtained by multiplying the upstream gradient with the other input, the x, and vice versa. Here's another one, the bias block. You might say, yeah, the bias block, somehow it's already included in the w block. Yeah, you can view it, but we can also have a single block for that one, right? If we want to make it, make it explicit. And here the x will have the same dimensionality of the w. So the x might be already some w x something else, okay? So basically that might be already the operation, the, uh, the result of a linear operation, and now we add some bias. So the derivatives here are super simple. With respect to b, it will be just one. So the local derivative is one. So we just copy the derivatives that comes from the upstream and we pass it on to the b for the gradient descent. Similarly here, we pass on the upstream gradient to the x just by multiplying it by one. Okay, fine, so far so good. Here's another one, tangent hyperbolicus block. This is component-wise nonlinearity. Could be written like this, yeah, if you like that notation, but actually that is Another notation for this equation, right? So a graphical one that shows you the computational steps or a mathematical one where we would say you compute it inside out. Now the derivatives here, we need to be a bit careful. So we um, know that basically the derivative of the tangent superbolicus is one minus tangent superbolicus squared, which is the expression one minus y times y. So here I'm reusing basically the output y. I'm using it here for the derivative, which is quite nice. And I'm multiplying now here the upstream derivative with that one. However, be careful with the dimensionalities. And typically it's implemented by just doing a dot multiplication yet. Again, we need to be careful with the dimensionalities here. Yeah? So I think the convention here is that the derivative of e with respect to the x in this case is a row vector, and then everything is fine. Okay, that's why here's the transpose sign up here, because y is a column vector, and then 1 minus blah is a column vector, transpose it's a row vector, 
times the upstream gradient, uh, not gradient, but derivative. Here's another one, the one from the logistic regression. And also there's a nice formula, yeah, we often call the logistic regression function sigma of x. So it's sigma of x times one minus sigma of x. And the rest is the same. Then we have the ReLU. The ReLU is just another nonlinearity, just a linear function for positive numbers and constant zero for all negative numbers. Surprisingly, this seemingly stupid function is working very well and leading to very nice convergence for classification algorithms. In our notation with Iverson brackets, we can also write it just as x being greater or equal to zero multiplied dot multiplied with x. Yeah, so this one is a vector of the same shape as x and with of ones and zeros and it can be multiplied with the x. Similarly, now here the derivatives can be also computed and it's also just this x being greater or zero put into a diagonal. Okay, so it's basically the same operation. So in a way, we are also doing the ReLU backwards, right? So this computation here yeah, is the same computation as the forward computation, which is kind of nice as well. Convolutional blocks. Now, what is a convolution? Um, so for that one, maybe I need to er erase the board and, and tell you a little bit about convolutional neural networks. So in general, the linear block looks like that. It's just a matrix times a vector, and typically we call this W. However, this W might have really lots of parameters. So suppose this is a, this is a megapixel image and we linearly transform it, then this W is just huge, right? It's just a million by a million entries. And this is again the, the, the idea that we want to have efficient computation along our network. So this is typically way too expensive. However, the linearity is a nice property, okay? So what would be something that is linear but has much fewer parameters? The answer would be a convolution, okay? And for the convolution, we would take a look at a special case of this matrix. So we don't want to have it completely full, but we, we, the first thing would be to put only entries on the diagonal, okay? So that was the, the first possibility. However, that's a bit boring, right? So this is just scaling. Um, the x with these entries. So to make it a little bit more interesting, let's put a couple of more things on the diagonal, okay? So now it's getting more interesting, right? So now suppose this thing is a thousand by one and this is a thousand by a thousand. However, if I only having four diagonals activated, then I can store it in four times thousand entries and also the matrix vector multiplication yeah, can be done very efficiently, right? I need to multiply it with the first diagonal, with the second, with the third, and I sum everything up. Now you might say, but they are different size. Ah, let's make them equal size, okay? And that basically makes the matrix um, slightly longer. Where I now drawing it wrongly? I think I need to make it slightly longer the other way around. Let's take the other diagonal, so let's take that one, and then we take all of these, okay? So let's make the matrix slightly larger, and then it will be a 1,000, three times 1,000 matrix, okay? And now I'm having four diagonals, and if I now say W times X, it's like scalar multiplication, like uh, component-wise multiplication with the first diagonal, with the second, with the third, and summing up all these results. Um, now we can make it even more efficient, right? This is still quite expensive. It's like four times the number of pixels I have in my image. Let's say I'm having only four numbers and I'm repeating them, okay? So these four numbers here are the same as those four numbers and they are the same as those four numbers, okay? That makes it even more efficient and as it turns out, if, um, let me think, if that number is the same as that one, uh, what about this number? It will be the same as the second one, and the third one is the same as that one, and the last one is the same as the last one. I can also see, view it the other way around. So here are basically always the same numbers. And again, okay, now I'm glossing over some of the details. So in principle, what I'm doing here is, I'm having a big matrix where I'm having, um, lots of rows in here that are all having exactly the same numbers and I'm multiplying it with my vector x, okay? Now what's happening? It's like 
having this piece aligned with the top part and then with the next part and then with the next part. So in order to calculate the first entry of my y, I'm basically taking all these numbers in here and I'm multiplying them with some part of x and ignoring the rest and summing everything up that gives me this entry. For, um, so this is y1. So for y17, for example, I would take here the 17th row, I put it at the right location, I'm multiplying it with the x and summing everything up. And this operation is called the convolution. Now, how many parameters would I have? I would only have four numbers. But in principle, I'm doing an interesting operation on the whole vector x. So I don't know whether you like my messy, messy uh, description of this one. Let me again describe it. So this is my x. And now my first entry up here is basically taking now this vector from my w and multiplying it with the entries here and then summing everything up and so on and so forth. This can be also generalized to images, okay? So in images, it would look like this, that now say the x is itself a thousand by thousand image. So in principle, now I could do the same thing. I could vectorize the x and multiply it cleverly with some w, right? However, typically that's not what we're doing. What we're doing is we say, now let's say we have a filter. So this is now the same as a row with four times one entry, but let's say we have four by four entries. Then we could say, now we calculate the convolution of those. And for that, there's a new symbol here. So this is like a special star for the convolution. And this generates me another one. And that is again then a thousand by a thousand dimensional image. So this might be four by four, and this is a thousand by a thousand. And this convolution operation is basically a clever way of having a linear combination of pixels in X. Okay, now, how does it look like visually? So suppose this is my image 1000 by 1000 pixel of X. This A is a little image of four by four pixels. In principle, I'm taking that one, I'm putting it on the top left corner, I'm multiplying the pixels with each other and summing everything up. And this is giving me the top left corner of my y, OK? And then convolution means that I'm now moving this window along the whole image. And for each of the locations, I'm calculating the number and then basically filling up the whole matrix. So that is the convolution. So why might that be a nice idea? So suppose your filter kind of is a smiley detector. yeah. Then you have all zeros, and at some locations you might have ones in here. And this might not be 4 by 4, but let's say this is 40 by 40, so that you can really draw like something like this. Now, if I take this image and I move it all over the place, yeah, and in my x there is actually really a smiley at one location, then this thing will report everywhere zero, yeah, where there's no smiley, and once it's perfectly aligned with the actual smiley, it will generate a number. So I will get one of the pixels that is very active, and all the other pixels, they are switched off. OK? There are other detectors. There might be like something like this. So that might be a detector that is able to detect like diagonal lines on the images. OK? And there might be another detector which can, just, can find straight lines. And now you could imagine by having several of these filters, yeah, which are reasonably small compared to the images, I can have a very complex description of my image. I can go over my image and look for straight lines that are like this. I can look for diagonal lines. I can look for smileys. I can look for circles. I can look for other shapes. And basically getting these kind of maps. And then by these maps, combining them again, I can then do very good classification or something. So where did we start? So basically, we are talking about linear operations where the x can be very large, and we want to have only fewer parameters than 1,000 by 1,000. And so convolution is one possibility for that that also has a very nice interpretation. By the way, this now becomes very neuronal here, like neurons here, because this is really like the retina style thing. So if this is your retina, there might be 
a certain neuron now in your visual cortex, which is collected, uh, connected just to this receptive field, to this area here, and making a certain linear combination. And if here a smiley, if, is, if there's a smiley appearing here, then this neuron will fire. And by repeating this receptive field all over the place with the same wiring, basically we have like in the next layer we can detect where in the area there's a smiley or something. And that's reasonably how we would expect maybe the visual system is really working. Okay, so a convolution can do something clever like that. So let's, there's more to say about it, about convolutions. And there's a whole lecture on deep learning where I think there might be a whole lecture on convolutions. But the key thing is, it is a linear operation, okay? And it's very efficiently computable. So it can be calculated in n log n, which is much faster than n squared for a usual matrix vector multiplication. So it has very nice properties. And there are derivatives as well, which I don't spell out here. But as a preview, it will be something like W transpose, right? And when you look at the at my picture that I shown before, so there was the W. W was looking like this. Yeah, for the 1D case. And we know that for the derivative, we need to multiply with W transpose. So W transpose looks like that. And then I said, OK, uh, these entries, they repeat themselves also as columns. Yeah, then we see that in principle, the W, the W transpose, they can both be seen as convolution. So also that can be seen as a convolution operation. So if we can do the matrix multiplication up here in n log n, yeah, then we can also do the transpose one, again, in an efficient way. So there are lots of nice properties that, are, that can be used. Similarly for this operation here. OK, so far so good. There's another one called max pooling. That is the so-called downsampling. It can be also written as a matrix, OK? So let me again show you a little bit of matrix tricks here. So how could it down, what should a downsampling matrix do, and how could it look like? And again, I'm showing you the 1D version, but they are typically easily generalizable to higher, higher versions. So here's another linear operation, which is interesting. Suppose um, your x is something like whatever. Uh, one, blah, 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 let's have another one. So, so this is your x, okay? And now I want to have an operation which is generating some y, which is only three-dimensional, okay? So I want to have a downsampling operation which kind of keeps the information. How could I do it? Simplest way would be just to pick every second element, yeah? That looks like very stupid in this case, but if you have an image, like the one you've seen on your screen right now, you see this green area, the pixels have all the same values, so it doesn't matter whether I, I omit every second one, okay? Of course, a better way might be to average neighboring pixels, okay? However, let's first look at the one that selects like every other pixel. So for that one, we need to have a matrix which has like three rows and six columns, right? So this is our W now. And now we just need to put ones in here, right? So the first entry here, this one, should be the 17. How do I organize that? I want to have row times column. So I will have a one over here. And then I having, for the remainder, I having zeros. For the second one, I want to have some one. OK, fine. You can get it. 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. And for the last one, I'm taking the second last element to get the minus a. Okay, now this is a downsampling matrix, okay? Of course, we could be a bit more sophisticated. We could say, okay, let's put one half in here, right? Then we would average neighboring pixels, right? If I do a row times column, I would do the average of 17 and uh, 42, which is something like 30. The average of 1 and minus 5 is something like minus 2. And the average of minus 8 and 3 is something like, I don't know, minus 2. Yeah, I don't know whether the numbers are exactly right, but approximately. Yeah? And so this is a downsampling operation. Of course, you would never implement it by defining the w. However, 
this is a certain algorithm, right? So it's like averaging neighboring pixels, and that can be implemented like that by iterating over the x and averaging neighboring pixels. But we can describe it as a matrix, OK? If we can describe our algorithm as a matrix, that's very useful because then we immediately get the required derivatives. It's just a transpose of this operation. And we can think of an algorithm which is then very efficient in doing exactly the transpose operation. Okay, That's why it's interesting to think about it as matrices. However, we would never implement it as a w times a vector, or in this case, it's d. Yeah, so it's the same. So far, so good. Please put your questions in the chat if I'm too fast or too unclear. Okay. So, and also for that one, now there's no parameter here. However, we need to do some back propagation here. Somehow, even though there's no parameter, there is a local derivative with respect to x that needs to be combined with the upstream derivative. As it turns out, the local derivative is just the d itself, but transposed. Now, in our notation, if the upstream gradient or the upstream derivative is a row vector, it's like multiplying the row vector from the right with the downsampling matrix. However, multiplying it from the, down, from the uh, right, it's basically upsampling the whole thing, right? In this case, um, the, the input might be, um, you can't see it, if I multiplied something from a row vector times w, it would be like 3, a 3 vector times this thing, there will be a 6 dimensional row vector. So it will blow up the vector, this operation. So, for example, if I have uh, lots of zeros and ones here, it will just fill up the vector with zeros. Yeah? So that is the operation. If I'm having these one half, I think it will just copy the thing appropriately in there. Okay. Here's another one, another block which looks a bit surprising: the squared loss block. Okay. So how is that a parameter? Uh, how is that? Where's the parameter? Where's the input? So it's an example of a block that has two inputs. The t are the target values, so those are the true values, and we don't want to change them. So they are not parameters, they are also fixed. And then there's the y, which might be the result of some other computation blocks, maybe of a convolution. Okay, and then we have, or you know, they actually should be, yeah, maybe of a convolution or some other operation, but they should be now as close as possible to the t. But this is a vector, and the t is also a vector. However, at the end, we need a scalar, okay? So the squared loss will calculate the scalar just by the function. Now, why do we put it into the computational graph? Because at the end of the computational graph, we always want to have a scalar. Um, when we then use the neural network, typically we stop right before the loss and we say the output of our neural network is equal to y, okay? And it's just there, okay, I just wrote it down here. It's, it's for convenience here. It's not part of the solution of the neural network. It's there to be like the compute, uh, complete computation and there that we can start at the end with the derivative of e with respect to e is equal to one. And there are other losses. There's a so-called softmax loss. So that's another one, which is basically here, um, what is it doing? Yeah, logarithm and exponential are kind of, um, resolving itself, but we are kind of normalizing these things by this operation. And then there are some parameters as well that you could put in here to kind of have a winner takes all strategy, but being continuously di differentiable with respect to all variables. Okay, so this is like a soft max. So it's like taking the maximum value among a list of values in Y, but being at the same time differentiable. Okay, good. So that's another one. I showed you these slides already. We can plug these all blocks together to get a complicated computation. So far, so good. Now, if you invent your own block, let's say the let's say Z one, the convolutional block, and you have a new one that you come up with with a nice linear operation, for example, you need to implement two functions in your object. You need to implement the forward function for the forward computation, and then the backward function, which is calculating these two things, and then pushing them back, okay? So those are the two essential steps. So far, so good. Let's look at a couple of famous examples, and then I also want to do some coding. So this is a super famous one, Lenet 5, or maybe Lenet 5, I don't know, the people are French. The authors are Jan Lecun and Léon Boutou and some others, which I didn't 
put here, but they are famous for this one, and it's from the 1990s. Yeah? It was developed at AT&T. AT&T is a big telephone company in the US, which is like today Google Labs or Facebook Labs or whatever big company labs, okay? So that was like high-tech labs who were doing super fancy thing, and Jan Lecun, Leon Boutou were there, I think as students even, and they were developing this one to robustly recognize digits. And according to Jan Lecun, this Lynette software has been used for a decade, so for over 10 years, to read basically the digits of almost 10 to 20% of all US checks. And if you know in the US, when you do an Überweisung, yeah, if you give someone money, you don't do it with these typical Überweisung thing, but instead you have checks, like you have pieces of paper that you get from a bank. And when I write down a certain amount of money on this and I give it to you, it's like money, okay? So, and they need to be automatically read in at the banks again to cash the person who wants to get the money. And this system has been used in industry. So that was really working very, very well. And there is a nice demo here at this link, which is, oh, it's still working, perfect. So this is the old demo, right? From Jan Le Coeur. this is super old. This is like the history of something. And he programmed this nice thing. I think there's even a video from 1990 where sitting in front of the computer and there this video is running. And this is showing you like intermediate representation where these are now the examples of a convolution, right? So you have this input image and you put a convolution on and this one is recognizing like vertical ones and some other orientations and some other ones. Those are deeper hidden layers that then gets computed. And here you see how robustly it's really computing these ones. By the way, when you invent such a method like that, it's not only about inventing it, writing the paper, getting a publication, make a nice website for it as well, make a nice movie, make a nice demo, okay? So this one will be looked at much more than your paper when you write something, yeah? And this one is very convincing that it's super stable. And they are saying, uh, are there more? I think there are more um, unusual patterns. So here's another one. Oh, here's another, some other examples. It's still able to recognize that it's a two or that that is a three. So it's a very nice demo. Now you can play around. I, we can't play around with it, but if you're a researcher, you put, put these two zeros and you drag them out and then you want to see how your network breaks. How long does it think that it's an eight? So how far can you put them out of um, between, uh, how, how much can you, um, moves it apart. Here's some other weird examples they did, right? So really sh showing that the system is super robust and at the same time being very creative about it, right? And those are, I mean, this is quite amazing one, I think. So this is like an outline thing where you have a shadow, you only see the shadow, or one with only dots. And it's still working. This possibly reminds you of these, there's this gestalt psychology stuff where you have like triangle thing and you see a triangle even that there is none. So this looks almost like these examples and it can recognize it. And as I say, this is 1990. Yeah? So this is really back in the good old days. Here's the paper. Oh, this are some tricks. It's from the 90s. Oh, where is it? So this one, for example. Um, handwritten digit recognition with a back propagation one. This I think is, I guess this is the Lynette paper from 1990. So it's really, really old. Okay, and it's still now easy to do, right? So what are the operations? We have a 32 by 32 input image, and then we have a convolutional layer, yeah, where we have um, some, I don't know what the size is here, uh, or I have to check it, let's say six by six pixel, and each filter, they, these are also called filters, these six by six um, small convolutions, they produce one of these maps. So basically what we've seen on top of each other, it's computing several different, different filters on the input image and then doing it hierarchically for a couple of times. So here's a subsampling operation that we've seen and another convolution and another subsampling operation and finally, everything is fully connected to calculate these final layers and to calculate the final 10-dimensional vector. Of course, times have changed. This is a paper from the revival of neural network from 2012 from um, Krzyzewski, Satzkewa and Geoffrey Hinton. 
So this is a deep neural network for the image net classification. Yeah, maybe you would now say, yeah, okay, of course, you can use neural networks or deep learning to do that. In 2012, people were not thinking that you can use it for image net recognition, okay? So that was like a revolution that you could use a neural network to solve this image problem. And what was the problem here? The data set is from Fai Fai Li, so who's also a professor in Stanford, and she collected 1.2 million images. Yeah, so there's the old MNIST digit set with 68,000 di handwritten digits. That is a super big data set that is possible through the internet. And there are a thousand classes, so the task is much, much more difficult. Yeah, and they trained a super large network. It's so large, it's not fitting even into the figure. But the structure is the same as Lynette. So you have an input image, in this case, three color channels, and it's 224 by 224 pixels. You have 11 by 11 filters and generating lots of different maps. So you have lots of 11 by 11 filters to calculating different color channels. However, you split it onto two GPUs. So the bottom part is just as large to just fit on a 2012 GPU. And the top part is just as large to fit on another 2012 GPU. And then at the end, the results are combined on another machine. Okay, so they just scaled it as large as possible. Because of course, the practitioner question is not, now how do you choose the parameters? How do you know what to do? You do it as large as you can, as you can do when you really want to solve a super hard problem. And this is an example. So those are typical images. So where's my mouse? My mouse is gone. Okay, there it is. So this is an example of a mite, of a container ship, of a motor scooter. Where's the scooter? So the scooter is here. You can see it here with two persons sitting on it. And it's a leopard. And the network that they trained nicely has like the mite as the best guess. And it might think it's a black widow, a cockroach, or a tick, or a starfish. So if you know these things, they are reasonable choices. They are not completely arbitrary. Similarly here, the, the container ship, lifeboat, amphibian, fireboat, drilling platform. Curious, these are all things from the sea, right? Everything that's happened on, on, on water. Probably it's also using information from around, right? But it's very clear that it's a container ship, maybe from these kind of textures that it has up here. And so on and so forth. This one is interesting, the Dalmatian, so this dog. The second one is grapes, and grapes are the fruits in the front here, which is quite reasonable, right? So this is quite good. Um, and so on and so forth. So here's a red red car, which is mistakenly might be a, a fire engine, okay? The network thinks it's a convertible, which is a convertible, so it is a convertible. However, the word was, it's about the grill, about the thing in front of here. So this is a grill. But the network kind of found a better answer and so on and so forth. So it was super amazing that this is possible. Um, let's move on to some code before, I think the remainder of the lecture I show you next time. Let's move on to coding. Any questions up to here? Maybe not. Okay, so here's now our multi-layer network from last time and we had a NumPy implementation, okay? Let's go step by step towards Lynette, okay? so. The implementation was by hand. So we had a forward computation, which is just a code from the slide. We have a backward computation, which didn't use backpropagation or anything. It was just a derivative that we derived on the board with matrix differential calculus. However, the computations are organized very nicely and very cleverly, right? So, so to compute this derivative B1e, we are reusing the derivative from the previous steps. So we are doing it kind of step by step. And there was like a nice slide which was structuring the terms that will appear. And that was already showing that to calculate this derivative, we need to multiply with the local derivative of the operation. And that is exactly what's happening here. So we are doing here back propagation, but we haven't invented it or used it. We just use the roots of differentiation. And then we do the gradient descent. And it was working, it was working somehow, but not great. Okay, it was doing something, but not very nice. So let's look at the next iteration. The next iteration is now a PyTorch implementation. However, a very simplistic one. So we just translated all the NumPy things into PyTorch. As you know, NumPy is a subset of PyTorch. So PyTorch has also a, um, a complete matrix library 
with all the functions that you can do in NumPy, I think almost all of them. So this is just translating the code from PyTorch, uh, from NumPy to PyTorch. So instead of using NumPy random, we now use torch.randn, which is the function for that one. Similarly, instead of using np.tangentsuperbolicus, we are using the torch version of that one. The rest stays the same. Yeah, I literally translated the code for the torch version. So why did I do it? So this is one step. So this is not using any of the tricks of PyTorch yet, but it's using right, just using Torch as it would have been NumPy. So now, and it, the computations are very similar and we get very similar results, very similar bad results, okay, which is good. However, now it gets more interesting. Let's now do automatic differentiation. So PyTorch is a matrix library for deep learning that gives you the automatic differentiation for free. So basically now this works like this. For all the parameters that we have, w1, w2, and so on and so forth, now we have another parameter for the red end. We can say it requires a gradient, okay? And by this, we are marking it that it's kind of um, get some special arrangement. So we not only need to store the values, the d times m1 values, but we also need to store in the object the gradient at some point. And we need to know where it comes from, how it was computed. So we need to store the computation somewhere. So let me just um, let me just see whether I can run the code like this. So where are we? Um, okay, let me see whether this code goes. It goes, fine. So after doing nothing, yeah, the gradient is just none. There is no gradient yet because I haven't done any computation yet. However, let's, for fun, let's say now we have BB is equal to W1 um, times W1 transpose, okay? So the W1 is a special torch obje object that requires a gradient. So let's say we do this and let's look at the B. So the B is now, it's also a torch thing and it has this grad function backward thing in here. So now it did a forward operation on a special variable. And for that one, we can also do a backward operation to calculate the gradient. So let me just check how to do it exactly. So I'm now just saying v dot v dot backwards, I think. So is that the right word? No, backward. So I just did a forward computation. I used a specially decorated variable and squared it basically. And now I take the result and I say, push the gradient backward. So let's do that. Ah, I maybe I should do it like this. I should calculate the norm of that one. So how do I do this? Torch punk norm of that one, does it work? Yes, it works because I need a scalar. Okay, now the BB should be a scalar, it is. And let's check again the W1 grad. There are still none, okay, nothing there yet. But let's run the backward operation. And now something magic has happened. Now basically the whole computation has been done backwards. So how is this possible? The object BB knows how it is computed. Basically it knows what operations have been done. So basically I'm doing here W times W. This is generating a new PyTorch object which knows I'm coming from W1 and I'm a squared version of it. And then comes another torch operation taking the norm of something and the result of this torch norm operation is, whoops, Another object which knows I have been calculated using the function norm and the input was something else. And then if I call the backward operation on a scalar, it will back propagate all the information from the BB back to all the variables that are in there. And now after I've done that one, um, now BB dot backwards, let's keep it here. Now the gradient will contain a gradient just like this. And it has been automatically calculated, okay? So what I can do with these numbers now is I can do an arbitrary computation up to the loss and then I say backwards and then all the variables know their gradients just by magic, okay? So let's have a look at, let's execute that one again and let's maybe get rid of these lines here because they will confuse the code if I run it again. So Here's now my forward function and I call it model. It takes the X, it does the same operations as before and returns the Y. 
Now I'm taking one of the examples, I'm running the forward operation, which is now running the forward operation with decorated parameters here that require a gradient. I need to continue it a little bit to calculate the error, yeah, and then I'm just calling the backward function on the error and I can do the updates. However, there are now a couple of subtleties here. So one subtlety is I first need to set all gradients to zero if they are there. Why? Because the W1, it could appear several times in my computational graph and it, it just adds up all the gradients that it receives, right? Because it could have ma many outgoing arrows and so it needs to sum up all gradients. So in order to do a correct calculation, I first need to zero them. Yeah, so that's the first step I need to do. And then for the update, I'm updating it. I'm not updating the W itself, but I'm updating the dot data. Whoa, what's going on here? And the dot data one is like a NumPy array contained in the PyTorch array, okay? So the PyTorch array has some space for the data and for the gradient. And here I only need to update the data. And then I again do the same thing again. And I hope this will work now. So this will do a similar computation as before. Okay, I can calculate a confusion matrix and so on and so forth. So that is like the first step towards automatic differentiation. What did we get? We were able to remove all the matrix differential calculus formulas that we derived and have it automatically computed. However, we can do even better. By the way, I see I'm running shortly over time. So feel free to leave already if you want. It will be all recorded. So let's go one step further and let's have the whole neural network with PyTorch and have it as clever as possible. So again, the code is the same, as close as possible to the one before. Um, and now we've wrote basically these um, operations that I did before, I rewrote them now with torch layers. So I'm now saying my model, which is a function that takes an X and spits out a Y, it should be a sequential model, which has all these layers. So the first step is flattening my images into a N by 784. Then I'm having the linear layer as before, tangent superbolicus, another linear layer, tangent superbolicus, another linear layer. However, if I run this one, it generates now a function and I can ask what parameters are in here. And if you look at these ones, those are exactly the same parameters as W1, W2, W3, but they don't have the names anymore. I leave that to PyTorch to deal with it. I just want to write down the layers of my neural network and then the parameters are hidden in here, okay? So why is that nice? Because now my code gets really short. So I only do the forward steps, which is calling the model on an example, and then I'm calculating loss function, which I defined up where, up somewhere up as well. I need to zero out all the existing gradients from the previous iterations, which is one operation. Why can it do it automatically? Because it knows the parameters of the model. So it knows which variables in the model are the parameters that I'm looking for. So we can do it automatically. Yeah, so the optimizer here gets initialized, so that's another one, the torch optim dot stochastic gradient descent. It gets the list of parameters from the model, okay? And then I need to calculate the gradients and I need to step, I need to update the parameters. So these steps now are the same as the code before, but now fully hidden in some PyTorch functions, okay? so. This is zeroing the gradients, this is pushing the back the loss backward as before, and this is doing all the update steps where I'm using stochastic gradient descent. Now, of course, I could use here some others. There's Adam, or there are some many other methods that you can use, and you can just plug it in here and everything will work fine. Let's keep the stochastic gradient descent and hope that it works. And as you can see, it's minimizing everything nicely. So it's the same code. Yeah, so here you see several iterations, NumPy, PyTorch, PyTorch using backprop, then PyTorch using also optimization automatically, okay? Great, so far so good. It's working a little bit better now because I'm using a bigger network. However, let's go one step further and let's re-implement Lynette, okay? So now follows basically a re-implementation of Lynette. Only thing we need to do is we need to change our sequential model. 
So far we had this sequential model. Yeah, now we take the Lynette sequential model. And where did I get all these numbers? Just look at the paper or look at some website. There they say, okay, there's a, the first is a 2D convolutional layer yeah, with certain shapes. And then there's the Rilu, and then comes Max Pudding. But I think Rilu they didn't use. I think they used Sangen Superbolicus. Okay, little change here. Then again, a convolutional layer, and again a Rilu, and so on and so forth. Okay, so you just stack them on top of each other. I define a loss function with one line. So this is generating me a function. Yeah, this is somewhat software engineering style. So torch.nn.mse loss with a capital N is a constructor, yeah? And when you call it, it generates a function, yeah? So the output of this is a function which does the right thing, which knows forward computation and backward computation, okay? Great, so now I'm having this model and I'm having a loss function. I take an example, push it through my model, push the solution, the results through the loss function, and then again, do my magic from PyTorch. Set the gradient to zero, run the loss backwards, and do optimizer steps. Let's, let's run that one, and let's see how, how good we are now. And here you see, hopefully, that the test error goes down. Okay, test error is 0 0.88, which I'm now not super sure how it is computed. Um, how am I computing the test error? So oh, I'm just saying this one not equal to that one. Okay, so it's quite wrong at the beginning. So it's like having 90% wrong, okay? 90% wrong is completely random, right? If you have 10 classes and you guess always the first class, only one tenth of the cases you are correct. And now you see how the test error is going down. Yeah, it's going down to 0 0.13 after 12,000 examples. Let's, let's run it. So it takes a little bit more time to run it completely. Okay. If you don't want to wait now for another, uh, we go up to 68,000, so it takes a while. However, I pre-computed that one already and it goes down to 5%, which is quite nice. Yeah, so that is very good already. And I can also compute the confusion matrix and the confusion matrix now also looks really nice for Lynette. Okay, so that is the one. And I guess that is the one on the test set. So it's the one on data that hasn't been used. Okay, so far so good. Anything else here? Okay, yeah, I, I played around somehow with the sizes. So you could try to tweak more out of this now by changing the model. Okay, this is basically it about neural networks. Next time, I think we look at a couple of more little details, but I'm not sure how much time I will spend on Wednesday on that one. So now you see the key to neural networks is at the beginning linear regression and nonlinearity, and then having a loss function that we minimize using the chain rule. However, later on when you do neural networks, basically you're only thinking in terms of these layers and you view them as Lego bricks. So you can design your own network using these kind of super powerful functions and then you always run it through kind of the same code. You kind of need to generate your data, get that one, and then you need to do backpropagation and optimize your ways. However, this get it to get it so far, it requires a lot of fiddling around and playing around with parameters. So it's not as easy as it looks. However, you can use this notebook maybe as a starting point for your own projects when you want to play around with something like this. Um, can PyTorch use the GPU? Oh, very good question. So my, I have one of these nice, really nice MacBooks with lots of memory and with these super duper GPUs, but I haven't figured out yet how to use the GPU for something like this. So um, I think you can, you can use it if you compile it. I think in PyTorch on the Mac, you could use the GPUs and PyTorch uses NVIDIA GPUs um, by default if they are there, I guess. But there's always some fiddling around with it to get it working. It should be much faster. Any other questions? If not, then we are for today at the end of the lecture. So there are some tricks of the trade that we look at last uh, next time, but I think we keep it short. So thanks for your attention. Thanks to switch on the camera and I see you next time.